There's one last thing that we need in Rust when it comes to breaking the rules and you know, doing it for performance and maybe fun. And it is the dark and terrible magic. It is unsafe. Unsafe exists because it has to. The compiler would rather err on the side of caution and say no to a program that's correct than say yes to one that is incorrect. You might also need to interact with a library, particularly one not written in Rust, which doesn't offer you the same guarantees that something written in Rust might, uh, or interact with the hardware, write some low-level code, something like that. So for these purposes, we get the option, if we wish, to turn off some of the safeties. We can uh, override the defaults and tell the compiler we promise we know it's okay or at the very least we accept that things could go wrong um, you do so at your own risk because if you get it wrong you get all the problems that rust tries to avoid segmentation faults memory leaks uh, any of those kinds of things uh, that hopefully could be avoided if you wrote safe code as per usual but if you do it in unsafe code you have these risks now, there's two ways to declare something as unsafe in Rust. Either you make a block you know, with sort of manual scoping. You say unsafe, open uh, parenthesis, or open curly brace, uh, and then you have an unsafe block. Uh, and at the end of the closing curly brace, the unsafe block ends. Uh, or you put in the function signature, this whole function is unsafe. Obviously, we suggest that you make unsafe segments as small as possible, so using the second option uh, of making the whole function unsafe is perhaps less good, uh, unless the, you know, the function is itself short and everything in there needs to be in there. But as much as is possible, you know, using unsafe code is to be avoided. Now, um, in, in any case, when you're in an unsafe block, what can you do? So, expectation, unlimited power. You can do absolutely anything in an unsafe block, uh, but the reality, uh, unfortunately, for His Majesty the Emperor, is uh, a little disappointing. I suppose I could have also put the reality is often disappointing meme here as well, um, but uh, I don't think I could ever say no to a Star Wars one. Okay, so there are five things that you can do in an unsafe block that you would normally not be permitted to do. Number one, call an unsafe function or method. Number two, access or modify a mutable static variable. Number three, implement an unsafe trait. Number four, access the fields of a union. And number five, dereference a raw pointer. That list is probably less extensive than you were expecting. Um, and declaring a block as unsafe really does not grant you the ability to do anything outside of those things. The borrow checker still exists. It still checks your work. There are still rules. Um, and um, the design intention for unsafe blocks is they're supposed to be small so that you know, the area to be audited uh, is, is small. Uh, just as we've discussed previously with critical sections, you want critical sections to be small because they're important, and if they are small, they're easier to audit and verify that they are correct, uh, particularly in a code review or similar. Uh, and even better, the Rust documentation hopes that you can abstract away some of the details uh, of such a thing behind its own uh, interface. Uh, and then a caller doesn't necessarily have to know that there's an unsafe implementation in this function. You might have to do so yourself when you're implementing that function, but uh, you, know, you can avoid having the unsafe part leak out into other parts of the code. Okay. So suppose we have a function that says it does something unsafe. Whatever it is, it does one of the things like access a mutable static variable or access fields of union or something like that. Uh, and it says in its function signature, unsafe. So its signature is unsafe function do unsafe thing. All right, to call it, uh, as the invocation, uh, as the caller, you have to wrap it in an unsafe block. So you say unsafe, and then in the curly braces, everything in there uh, is unsafe. It allows you to call an unsafe function. So just as we saw with references uh, and in making them mutable, 
uh, where the caller uh, of the function specifies I want this to be mutable and the uh, function signature says I want it to be mutable. Uh, unsafe requires uh, acknowledgement on both declaration, so in the function definition, uh, as well as invocation here in the unsafe block. Uh, this is a form of readback. Uh, this is a safety convention that, among other places, is used in aviation, uh, where you know, if the air traffic controller gives the plane some instruction, uh, then the person receiving the instruction reads back what they heard to confirm that they understood correctly. So if it's, you know... Um, the instruction is you're going to land on uh, this particular runway, then you repeat back, this is the runway that I'm going to, to land on. Um, runways, as far as I can recall, not that I'm an aviation expert, are, are based on their compass alignment. Um, so if it's you know, 230 degrees, uh, there would be a 230. So air traffic control would say you land on 230, and then you would read back and say, yes, I'm landing on 230. Uh, and that confirms to everybody that we understand each other, uh, and it's not, I thought you said, whereas uh, that could be potentially dangerous. Anyway... Um, if you try to use an unsafe function without it being in an unsafe block, as we see here, the compiler will say no, as it should. Um, now, you can just, of course, smash the unsafe block around it. Just say, yep, yeah, unsafe, open curly brace, then do unsafe thing, then close parentheses. Uh, and that is enough to make the compiler quiet, um, but not sufficient to make a thorough code reviewer comfortable with this. Uh, presumably, um, they would ask about whether you've carefully read the documentation of the function in question. Are you sure you're calling it with the right arguments? I mean, you did read the documentation, right? Right? Um, in, in this particular example, you know, with do unsafe thing, I mean, you know, it uh, doesn't take any arguments, so it seems like it would be hard to get it wrong. Uh, but for an unsafe function, you should be careful to check and see, uh, are we doing this correctly? Uh, and a code reviewer should focus in on unsafe blocks and say, hmm, there's something about this that, you know, needs extra scrutiny. So, uh, yeah, a good code reviewer should ask you if this is okay. Um, Rust tries pretty hard to discourage you from using global variables, and I think anyway they're right to do so. Um, so the second item in the unsafe thing is you can make global variables mutable in Rust if you want, but if you do so, you have to make it unsafe. Um, as I've said before, global variables do exist, uh, and they're a shortcut. We do it a lot in course assignments, labs, and exam questions, because on an exam question, the, the thing I want to test is something like, how do you use the mutex and the queue to solve the problem, not how well do you pass the mutex and the queue pointers from the main thread to the newly created thread. Um, but in production code, uh, global variables are usually not uh, very popular uh, and certainly not recommended because of their harm to you know, good software engineering principles. Rumors abound uh, that Oracle's code base uh, has a lot of global variables and is kind of a mess. Um, I don't know that personally to be true, um, but if their code does have a lot of global variables and it is a mess, you can imagine how it makes it very difficult for them to you know, add features or change things or you know, just generally have confidence that their software does what it's supposed to do. Um, a lot of your uh, important data is probably kept in Oracle database somewhere, so I don't know if that's going to keep you up at night uh, thinking about it. If uh, th you know, rumors uh, are true and things are bad, I don't know, uh, but maybe, maybe it should. In any case, um, if you find yourself for some reason making a global variable in Rust mutable, uh, I want you to stop and think very carefully about why you're doing this. Uh, and uh, if there's no better way, then uh, I guess you know, there, there's a reason why unsafe allows it. Uh, and it is acknowledgement that there are situations where this is the best outcome uh, or this is the best solution. But uh, they are few and far between, I think. Okay. Uh, the third thing you can do in the list is implement uh, an unsafe trait. Uh, if the trait, or uh, as we discussed earlier, interface you want to implement is itself unsafe and it says so in the function signature, the compiler forces you to admit that your implementation of it is also unsafe. Um, if you do so, um, you, know, you are acknowledging that you guarantee that what you're doing meets the requirements that the interface specifies, like send. 
uh, sand being uh, ensuring that you can move this between threads with no issues. Um, if you want to implement such a trait, you have to yourself provide certain guarantees that it does what it promises. Uh, and the unsafe keyword says uh, the responsibility is on you to live up to that promise. Uh, and then there are unions. Um, not, you know, unions as in labor unions or, or anything like that. Um, the C union. Uh, if we did not talk about unions in a course uh, that you've taken with me previously that uh, was programmed in C, it's because I really don't like union as a concept, but it is necessary in some cases. If you've learned about uh, the AIO interface, uh, for asynchronous I.O. Uh, there is a union in the definition of one of the structures, so you've kind of been forced to come to grips with it. Um, anyway, a, what is a union? Uh, you might not have uh, worked with it, but a union is like a struct, except a struct will be all of its contents. So if struct has three fields, uh, an integer, a floating point number, and a pointer, then the size for that um, type is the size of an integer plus the size of a floating point number plus the size of a pointer. Uh, and it can have three values uh, you know, stored in there, so e each component has its own value. A union is only one of those things at a time. So the union definition would look like a struct definition. It would say, okay, it's an int, uh, you know, int x floating point, so float... Uh, uh, float y uh, and uh, pointer uh, void star z. But union is only one of those things at a time. So you can you know, use the uh, integer property to assign it an integer value, and then later um, the, the caller uh, or who, the user of that value has to know oh, it does contain an integer uh, and unpack it and take the uh, integer value out of it, uh, again, using the dot x property. Uh, but you could also use that exact same thing, use the dot z property and assign a pointer. Unions are weird uh, in that regard. Um, there's no way to be totally sure uh, that the union that you're working with is containing the type that you expect it to contain. The memory that's allocated for it is the maximum of any of the one types. So if the you know, int is four bytes on your system and float is 32 bits, so it's also four bytes, uh, and you have a 64-bit system, so the pointer is eight bytes, the size of the union will be eight bytes because it's the maximum of those three and it contains one of the three things at a time uh, and there's no way of knowing uh, in advance which one it is i mean by convention you may know that you may say okay i set up the uh, callback that uses the union type so because i set it up i know when i'm creating it what type i want to use and i know when i'm receiving it in the callback what type it contains uh, but ultimately um, unions are kind of unsafe because there's no compile time guarantee that everything is correct so due to that uncertainty uh, a, of what the union actually contains you have to access its contents using an unsafe block uh, and then there are uh, raw pointers uh, and raw pointer is the last sort of magic power in the list uh, and uh, you can create a raw pointer in rust anywhere you like uh, we'll see in an example how to create one uh, shortly uh, but to dereference them that has to take place in an unsafe block Creating the raw pointer can't cause your program to crash, even though the raw pointer you create might be bogus, might be invalid. Um, creating them incorrectly guarantees that when you try to use them, it blows up in your face. Um, so you can argue about whose fault it is, but creating it is not going to crash the program, so it's considered safe. But using a raw pointer could crash your program, so it is unsafe. So here's how we would do it. Um, we'll say, you know, let uh, a mutable value here, num equals five, uh, and uh, we will then create some raw pointers here, uh, and we can have uh, an uh, immutable one, uh, r1, and a mutable one, r2. Uh, and then to actually dereference them in the unsafe block, uh, then we have to do so, and dereferencing them looks actually not too different from uh, what we've seen in, uh, in C or C++. You use the dereference operator. Uh, and there we go. Uh, when we create the raw pointers R1 and R2, uh, we you know, do the 
um, do the reference operator, and then uh, the as operator is a cast in Rust, uh, and we are saying either we're casting it to a constant pointer, so star const i32, or a mutable pointer, star mute 30, uh, i32, uh, and those are our raw pointers. You can also use raw pointers when you want to write to a particular memory address instead of having a pointer to uh, some other um, integer value. You just assign the value, so let uh, address equals hex uh, 0x dead beef, uh, and then you cast it to a raw pointer. Uh, and when you want to write data, you use the unsafe block, uh, and that is a way that you use memory map IO uh, within Rust. Gets the job done, uh, but does require you know, unsafe block to do it because you're acknowledging that something could go wrong. We've just uh, written to some memory address, who knows what we find there. Uh, that gives us uh, a little hint into something that we want to talk about shortly, uh, and that is that you might need this if you're calling into a C library or C function, something that is written in not Rust. Uh, the Rust universe of, of packages, they're, they're referred to as crates uh, broadly in Rust, is pretty large and it's getting bigger all the time, uh, but sometimes you have to interact with a library that was written in C. Uh, and in our next topic, when we get into asynchronous I.O., we're going to talk about curl. You may have previously worked with curl in C, uh, or uh, done a lot with it on the command line. Uh, I do a lot of command line curl stuff for web services. Um, it's not the fanciest tool, but it's the one I know the best, and I'm kind of used to it at this point. Um, but it might be interesting to see, even if we didn't have the crate for curl, what you would have to do to use the C library for it. So we'll look at curl in our next topic. <laughs>